Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Uh, so, a uh, couple things. So, uh, I sent a message about the YouTube channel. So, you should have uh, received an email uh, that was, uh, in the end, sent to you by way of Blackboard, the e-learning thing. Uh, the, the first lecture is posted to YouTube. Uh, I'll probably post uh, this one that we're making now tonight also. Uh, I believe my math lab is finally set up. <laughs> I couldn't set it up while e-learning while e was broken because it was broken all day yesterday. Uh, and then my math lab was evidently bro broken for at least part of the day. They kept sending me messages about it being broken. Whatever. I think it's there now. <clears throat> Good? Uh, and uh, the Wexes, uh, I intend to have them uh, posted tonight, and I'll send you a message. So any question about uh, any of those kinds of things? Okay. <clears throat> so today is uh, Thursday. And uh, when, we, when we ended last time, uh, we were talking about uh, composition and the chain rule. So uh, let's, let's resume right there. So uh, composition and the chain rule. So let's uh, begin with two functions. So suppose that uh, we say let f and g be functions. Uh, then one way to combine those functions to get another function is to add them. You can add them together, and then that's another function. Or you could subtract them, uh, or you can multiply them or divide them. Uh, but uh, there's something that you can do with functions that you can't do with numbers, and that's compose them. Uh, then the function f composed with g uh, is defined as f composed with g evaluate at x. Well, the, the way that you do it is you first, you, you give x to g. You say, okay, g, uh, do your thing. And uh, the way that uh, we denote the output of g uh, with input x is g of x like that. And then uh, once we have g of x, what do we do with g of x? Yeah, we give it to f. Say, okay, f. Uh, now, now you do your thing with the output of G. So as sort of a diagram, uh, you know, it's X. <clears throat> X is given to G, which produces G of X. And that output is in turn used as the input to F, which produces F of G of X. So that's what uh, composition means. You're, you're, in a sense, visiting functions in order and wiring up the uh, outputs of one as the inputs of the other. Uh, because you can do this with two functions, understand that you can do this with any number of functions. You can have like 50 functions all in a row. All right, so then the idea is that, uh, okay, using the definition of derivative, we can compute uh, the derivative of uh, these functions at any given input. And uh, so suppose that we know how to calculate the derivative of g, uh, and furthermore, we know how to c calculate the derivative of f. Uh, then the question is, is that uh, knowing that, how can we compute the derivative of the composition? So that's, the, that's what the chain rule is telling you, is that uh, if you've got some big machine, it's actually the composition of littler machines. And uh, if you know the derivative of each piece, 
then the chain rule tells you what the derivative of the whole ensemble is. Uh, so the chain rule. <coughs> Uh, so the chain rule uh, describes the derivative of F composed with G in terms of derivatives of F and G. Uh, specifically, the formula is uh, the following. Uh, the derivative of F of G of X, like so. Okay. So, uh, in order to do it, In order to do it, uh, we're going to need to compute uh, the derivative of G and also the derivative of F. So we'll have the derivative of G, and then uh, looking at um, the diagram, uh, what's the input to G? It's X, right? So that means that uh, here, uh, again, the input's going to need to be X. We're also going to have the derivative of F. We're also going to have the derivative of f. But uh, again, looking at the diagram, what is f's input? G of x. G of x. So here, uh, this must be g of x. And then uh, the way that uh, these two have to be combined, you have to ca calculate these uh, you know, in independently, in a sense. And am I supposed to add them together, or divide them, or what? Multiply, Multiply them. Uh, in the same kind of sense and for the same kind of reason that uh, when you use a compound microscope, the, uh, the uh, magnifications multiply. Just like that. Uh, now, uh, if, we, if we write uh, u equal g of x, then uh, that allows us to write an equivalent version of the chain rule that uh, is in some ways uh, useful and pleasing to the eye. Uh, it will look like this. So d dx f, and then where we see g of x, uh, let's write u. So this will be f of u. Uh, then this will be equal to the derivative of f evaluated at u, because again, we replaced that uh, g of x with u. And uh, now, what are we going to replace g prime with? u prime, except uh, I'm going to write du dx, another way to write uh, that. Uh, the reason why I'm going to write it that way is because uh, I want to emphasize something, and that is that uh, what we have you know, if we replace that symbol u with an x, because if this statement is true, if that statement is true, we ought to be able to replace the u with an x, and it's still just as true. Then this should be the derivative of f evaluated at x multiplied by dx dx. But now what's dx dx? It's one, it's one right? just one. That is to say, this is equal to one. Uh, so the purpose of me uh, showing this is uh, to kind of give you the idea that, oh, uh, in some sense, the chain rule is uh, the consequence of differentiating a function that's a function of u in terms of some other symbol, x, right? These are not in agreement, u and x. Whereas in this case, they are in agreement, x and x. So normally, when, it, when these are in agreement, you don't even write that part. 
and it's just this, the, the thing that you always knew before. Uh, so when these are not the same, that's when the action of the chain rule uh, becomes apparent. Okay, so let's have uh, an example. Uh, please, uh, would you compute the derivative of uh, something like, say, uh, 8 times x to uh, 10 plus, uh, I don't know, 7x, all of that raised to exponent 1, 3, 2, 6. Okay, so, uh, well, the input uh, symbol and the differentiation symbol is x. What I want you to observe is that uh, the first thing that you do with x is you evaluate that polynomial. So in a sense, that's, that polynomial is what is visited first. Right? It's sort of the first thing going this way. Then uh, after you've evaluated that polynomial, then you raise it to exponent 1, 3, 2, 6. So that's what happens second. So that's like uh, further down the line. Uh, but what I want you to see is that uh, the pattern of this looks like d dx and then some complicated thing that I'm just going to call u, u to 1, 3, 2, 6. That's the pattern that's at play here. Now, uh, if that u were exactly an x, then you should be able to tell me the derivative right now. What, what, would, uh, what would the derivative be if that u were an x? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. u to 1, 3, 2, 5. if that u were an x, but it isn't an x, it's a u, which means that uh, this correction factor also must be present. So we have to say multiplied by du dx. Okay, so is there any question why that's the pattern for this specific exercise? Okay, so let's use it. So that means that uh, the answer, you know, uh, the beginning of the calculation looks like this. 1, 3, 2, 6 multiplied by u, so 8x to 10 plus 7x to 1, 3, 2, 5. So, so far, that's uh, 1, 3, 2, 6, u to 1, 3, 2, 5. That's just that part. And now for the du dx, d dx, 8 x to 10 plus 7 x. So what I'm saying is that uh, this, this factor corresponds to that factor. Any question about this step? OK, so then uh, carrying it out, 1, 3, 2, 6. This first part is just copy paste because it's already finished. 8 times x to exponent 10 plus 7 times x to exponent 1, 3, 2, 5. Here I'm going to make a nice error. Uh, multiplied by, uh, so the derivative of 8x to 10 is uh, 80x to 9. Uh, and then the derivative of 7x is 7. So what do you think about that? There's something wrong here. 
Something's not right. What do you mean? On the final term, 80x minus 70. Right. Because uh, consider, uh, it's all of this stuff multiplied by all of that stuff, right? So it's, uh, you know, this thing multiplied by that thing, right? So uh, that means that, uh, you know, there's, remember that uh, things that are separated by pluses and minuses, those are called terms. Uh, that's their name. Things that are uh, separated by dots and divides, those are called factors. So what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, this is a factor and that's another factor. Now, it so happens that inside of this right factor, there's two terms. But uh, this left factor has to multiply both of them. Presently, is this left factor multiplying both of these? No, it's not. It's just multiplying the first one. Why is it just multiplying the first one? So I'm fishing for a phrase that starts with O. That one. The order of operations, right? The order of operations says that uh, multiplication has higher precedence than addition, which means that uh, this occurs first, not the addition. So as a result, the parentheses, yes. Now, uh, I'd like to point out that I spent like uh, a minute talking about that. <laughs> That's not because uh, like uh, that wasn't a whim. <laughs> it's because I, I, uh, I teach calculus courses a lot. And what I observe is that uh, that's the kind of thing that gets left off a lot. Any question about this one? Yeah? It's, it's fairly obvious when there's like an extra because you just saw the two functions, but how do you know, like what are the rules on if you do a really long term, how do you tell if it's two functions, like it has to be a G as opposed to like one long function? Okay. Let me, I'll answer your question with an exercise, I think. Right. So how about, uh, please evaluate the derivative of <coughs> the square root of uh, I don't know uh, something like uh, the exponential of 13 x squared minus uh, 25 x like so and then I'll add uh, you know 2018 in there or something Uh, do I want to? Yeah, yeah, we'll do it this way. Okay, like this. Okay. So, uh, the, the, using the chain rule is, uh, to some extent, like uh, peeling an onion from the outside. And it's like you want to take it uh, one layer at a time, uh, or you know, like uh, you might think. Uh, uh, what are those hard candies, you know, that have like uh, all the layers in them? You know what I'm talking about? Like a gum, gumdrop? No. Jawbreaker. Jaw, jawbreaker. Yeah, that one. They're like a, like a jawbreaker, right? You do, it, uh, you do it from the outside in. So the question is, is uh, well, uh, the question is, is what is the outermost function? What occurs last? The, uh, the, square, root. the square root does, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, in a sense, what happens first is you take your x, and the first thing you do with that x is that uh, you do that polynomial. After you've done that polynomial, then you use that as an input to the exponential function. Then you use the output of that as the input to the function that adds 2018. And then you use the output of that <laughs> as the input to the square root function. And then that's the end of the line. So uh, the square root function is the last thing. So in a sense, what I'm 
saying is that uh, you know, to, to analyze this correctly, you kind of just view that this is the derivative of the square root of a whole bunch of nonsense in there. So the pattern, uh, the pattern looks like the derivative of the square root of, and now we write, I'm going to write any symbol that's not x right there. Now we used u on the previous page. You could use u again, but uh, I don't want you to somehow, f you know, m m mistakenly think that u is somehow special. It's not. Uh, so I'm going to write about w. So uh, that's the pattern. Now uh, the derivative of square root is uh, one of the one of the things I said it's in your interest to memorize. So I'll assume you've memorized it. <laughs> If that were exactly x, then this would be 1 over 2 multiplied by square root of x. That's what uh, we'd write right there. But it's not. It's a w. So I'll write a w there. And uh, because that w is not an x, that means that the action of the chain rule uh, is visible. Uh, if it were an x, the action of the chain rule would still be there. But it, would in, but it would have no effect. It would be multiplying by dx dx, which is 1, which is the same as doing nothing. Uh, rather than that, we'll multiply by dw dx. And again, uh, I'll just note that dw dx, uh, of course, means the derivative with respect to x of w. That's its meaning. So, uh, this is the pattern we have to do. So I just, in a sense, just need to copy that down, uh, replacing uh, w with all that, uh, all the stuff that's in the radical. So this would be one over two square root exponential 13x squared minus 25x uh, and then plus 2018 so uh, that <clears throat> what we've written so far corresponds to uh, 1 over 2 square root w. Uh, and we have yet to write anything corresponding to the multiply by dw dx. So now multiply by the derivative of all this stuff. So now, uh, here's, here's the thing. You asked a question, and I said, I'll try to answer your question with a question. Uh, well, do you have any question about what occurred up to here? Now, here's the reason why I uh, set this example. It is that, uh, OK, in a sense, all this stuff at the front is done, and we're just going to have to copy it on down the line. So to some extent, uh, you can uh, intellectually now ignore it. Uh, we want to compute the derivative of this. Now, this is the derivative of a sum, and we have the sum rule. And this part is particularly easy because it's a constant. So to some extent, you can kind of ignore that one. Now, what, what will be necessary to compute the derivative of this exponential? Just copy the exponential. Right, and that, uh, that's uh, an example of the the chain rule, right? So the point is, is that uh, wait, what step did we, what uh, what rule did we use to get from here to here? The chain rule. And uh, what rule are we going to have to use to deal with that? The chain rule. So uh, 
in the end, uh, my response to your question is that uh, in some cases it has to be applied recursively, like this one. So uh, you had to do it once, and uh, we're going to have to do it again. Uh, from that, you should take away that uh, I could make you do it an arbitrary number of times. Okay, but, uh, uh, you know, it has to be bounded within reason, <laughs> obviously, right? Because uh, anything that I assign, I have to grade. <laughs> You know what I mean? <clears throat> Good. So, uh, fine. We need to continue. So, for this one, what's, uh, the pattern is uh, just, just for this part right here. Well, it would be the derivative with respect to x of the exponential of, and now we need some letter. Uh, and I don't want to use w because, uh, well, I already used w up there. I don't want to confuse anything. So, maybe I'll use, uh, I don't know, a. Only because I don't want, uh, uh, I don't want you to uh, mistakenly place too much uh, significance on the letter U. So the derivative of the exponential is the exponential. And if that A were an X, there'd be nothing more to write. Uh, but it is not an X. Uh, as a result, the chain rule makes itself apparent, and uh, we have to write the factor dA dx. Is there any question why that's the pattern, the rule that's holding here? Okay, so continuing now, this first part just gets copied. Okay, so then, uh, well, that'll be multiplied by the exponential of 13x squared minus 25x, because uh, we're calling that a. And then we'll need to multiply by the derivative of a. and then plus zero. Why plus zero? Right, that's what, that's, uh, that's what happened to the 2018. Okay, uh, so just a little bit, you know, one more step to go. But, uh, you know, that part is finished, that part is finished. Uh, we can leave off the plus zero. So one. to multiply exponential 13x squared minus 25. This first part's just being copied. Okay, so now uh, like that, exponential 13x squared minus 25x, and then multiplied by 26x minus 25. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> usually at this point, uh, some students are right on the cusp right on the verge of asking a question, so I'll ask it. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, wow, do I have to show that much work? Uh, and the answer is, only if you want credit, right? You know, if you don't want credit, you don't have to show any work. <laughs> you don't even have to come. Uh, your work is what's being graded. In, in some sense, you know, I asked you to compute the derivative of this expression, 
and that's the expression that is the derivative of it. Okay, yes. Uh, but uh, we could cut out the middleman and you could just type that into Wolfram Alpha, right? And then I wouldn't even have to ask you. If you, if you aren't aware, then th th there's a web page called Wolfram Alpha where you can like uh, just almost just like type your homework into it. Uh, it's not a secret, you know, I'm not revealing like state secrets here. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, if you don't show your work, then uh, I have no way to confirm or deny whether or not you, you have any idea what you're doing. Your work was, is what's being graded. Uh, so I want to be clear on how the sword cuts both ways. Now, you might think, uh, well, I'm going to test him to see just how many steps I can uh, omit without uh, losing credit. Go ahead. But uh, if, you, if you try to skip steps, very often I find that uh, students skip steps for, for two reasons. One reason is what's common to all of us. We're just lazy. Okay? We're, we're humans. Okay? This is, I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not uh, being hard on us. I, I think that's part of our common experience. I think that's why we come up with uh, efficient ways to do things, right? Uh, Good. Uh, the other reason is that uh, you may just not know how to do those steps. That's the other main reason. Uh, but at any rate, uh, if you skip steps and you make an error while you're skipping steps, uh, I've informed the graders that that's more or less indistinguishable from you having no idea what you're doing, which is to say that uh, you'll get uh, penalized harshly in such a case. Uh, on the other hand, you show a lot of work and you make an error, well, the, if the, the logical distance between steps is small enough and the error is uh, obvious enough to where the grader can say, oh yeah, they wanted to, uh, you know, they intended to do 3 multiplied by 5, which is 15, but, uh, you know, they had a brain cramp and uh, they accidentally, accidentally did 3 plus 5 and got 8. Okay, well, that's not a big deal. That's not, that's not a real big deal. Uh, but uh, if you skip a bunch of steps and you make an error and somewhere in there, you know, you did 3 times 5 and it became 3 plus 5 and it's nowhere evident that that, where that happened on the page, then uh, it just looks like you have no idea what you're doing. Yes? Uh, if we have different ways to show steps, is that okay? Like, even though it's more steps, I would have left it as an exponent, so like to the one half power and then did the work and then convert it at the end. No, 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 no. Uh, so, so to to be, to be clear, um, to make sure I uh, understand what you're saying, you're saying that uh, that uh, you're you're acknowledging that square root is equivalent to fractional exponent half, and you'd proceed thusly. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. But uh, here here's the here's a big problem, is that uh, you know this this uh, this exercise required uh, two consecutive uses of the chain rule. Very often, students try to sort of, in a sense, do them at the same time, and uh, it usually ends up in tears. So uh, please don't try to do that. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, as we alluded to last time, uh, a little bit, uh, there's sort of two, two, uh, two points of view in calculus. Uh, in a sense like the uh, uh, local point of view and the global point of view. The local point of view is that uh, if you find yourself walking around on a smooth curve, and it's smooth in the sense uh, that the derivative exists there, that means that uh, if you were small enough uh, and walking around on that world, then locally it would look like a line to you. And the name for that line that it looks like is the tangent line. You go further on in calculus and then uh, in higher dimensional uh, situations, uh, generally speaking, uh, the world that you walk around in uh, may look like a k-dimensional flat thing. So like a, a one-dimensional flat thing is a line. A two-dimensional flat thing is a plane. Uh, as it happens, you know, we, we live in a four-dimensional manifold. And uh, locally, it's not, it's not globally, globally Euclidean, but locally, as long as uh, we're not too close to a black hole or something like that, uh, it looks locally flat. So we live in a flat, more or less, flat four-dimensional manifold. Uh, in this class, we're talking about lines, though. Uh, 
The global point of view is that you can break things up into little pieces. And uh, in this class, the primary kind of piece that we're interested in is rectangles. So here's the, here's the thing. Is that, uh, suppose that we've forgotten everything that there is to know about shapes, uh, but we do know what angle is. So that uh, it's, and we do know what linear measure is, like we have a, uh, a, a linear measurement device, a ruler. Uh, and it's a sensible thing for us to say that two pieces of line are at right angles. So suppose that uh, we, you know, here's a nice shape. Let's come up with a name for it. Oh, let's call it a rectangle. Uh, then we'd like a, a, a measure which describes how much paint it would take to paint it. And we'd like to be able to calculate that. Okay, let's call a name for that. Let's give it a name. Uh, how about area? Okay, great. Area. Uh, and the formula for that is A multiplied by B. So what I want you to take away from this brief remark is that, is that uh, product A multiplied by B is intimately connected with area. It's a very, very uh, closely related. Now, uh, last time we went over the product rule for derivatives, or at least we, you know, we mentioned it. Well, evidently, uh, you know, since product has something to do with area, then the derivative of, and, and you know, areas have something to do with uh, rectangles, then somehow the product rule must be talking about a rectangle. And because derivative measures change, it must somehow be measuring something about how that rectangle is changing. So let's see what that is. Let's try and see if we can, uh, if we can uh, get, the, get the symbols to come out and describe for us just what, just how is the product rule uh, related to a rectangle. So this is the uh, geometry. of the product rule. So suppose that uh, u and v are functions of x. It doesn't matter what the functions are. Uh, but just so you have something concrete to write down, I'll say that, you know, that u is f of x and uh, v is g of x. But I'm not going to use f and g from here. Uh, then the product <coughs> uv uh, is the area of a rectangle. Uh, but here's the thing. You can imagine that, uh, you know, we've got x here. You know, like maybe this is the x-axis. And uh, that, the, that rectangle corresponds to, like, maybe this choice of x right there. So what I'm saying is that uh, if I grab hold of that x and wiggle it around, then, uh, then the rectangle will change. Right? Because if I move this x over to a different one, then because u is a function of x, u could be different. And v could be different. They could both be different. Uh, so suppose we uh, make a small change in x. and we call this change delta x. Well, that's going to re result uh, in, a, in a, you know, small is in scare quotes, right? small for whatever small means. Uh, that's going to result in a small change in u and a small change in v. 
Now, for just for sake of uh, illustration, I'm going to assume that uh, both of those changes are positive. But in principle, they could both be zero, one could be negative, one could be positive, they could both be negative. But uh, just to make the, uh, the picture easy to draw and understand, I'm just going to assume that they're both positive. Uh, suppose, well, suppose the corresponding changes in U and V uh, are both positive. So here's the original uh, rectangle. Oops. So that's the original, U and V. And then uh, U got a little bigger. So it got uh, this much bigger, say. And uh, V got a little bigger. I'm purposefully making it like uh, not as long as you, the change in you. So I, they could be the same, but I'm just making the picture that they're not the same. So that means that uh, the new product at the new value of x corresponds to a slightly bigger rectangle. So it corresponds to uh, this rectangle. So it got bigger. So now, let's look. Uh, <clears throat> let's look. The the increase in the area is that L shape. It's that L shape. Now, uh, of that increase, what part of it had nothing to do with V, and only depended on U? Well, that would be this part right here. Because uh, that part wouldn't be there if U had stayed the same, right? U got uh, that much bigger. And if U got, had gotten twice as big, then that would be twice as wide. If it got half as big, that'd be, uh, you know, skinnier. So that red bit there uh, only depended on the change in U. Uh, you know, this, this uh, right here. That linear width. Okay, now uh, part of it only depended on the change in V. What part only depended on the change in V? Like the whole thing? No, just the small thing. Just, just that one? No. <laughs> okay, just this one, huh? So just that much <clears throat> depended on the change in V. Okay, and then uh, finally, that top corner uh, depended on both of them, right? Depended on uh, it depended on how U changed and how V changed. So, in particular, uh, let's consider for a moment uh, what is the size of the red bit, the 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 part that we've shaded red. What's its base? Delta U, right? Because that red bit is a rectangle, right? What's its base? Delta U. What's its height? Just, just V, right? Because that, uh, that's the same height as the original rectangle. So this, this red bit has area delta U multiplied by V. What's the area of the green part? What's its base? U. What's its height? Delta 
Okay. Then uh, the thing, uh, the little bit in the, top, uh, in the top right, that little corner piece, it's also a rectangle. What's its base? And what's its height? Delta V. So uh, what we're saying is that uh, if you take a rectangle and uh, the base and the height depend uh, are u and v depend on a third variable x, and if you wiggle that uh, x around, that'll cause u and v to wiggle a little bit. And if it so happens that they both increase, then what you'll witness is something that looks like this. Uh, we have now four regions. The original region, the increase in the region that uh, only depended on how v changed, the increase in the region that only depended on, on how u changed, and uh, the increase in the region that depended on both. Now, here's the thing, is that uh, if we make uh, delta x be very small, that means that uh, these increases will in turn get small. So what I want you to imagine is imagine that uh, we take this red bit and we squeeze it, right? Squeeze, it's getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and skinnier until I can't really effectively draw it anymore on the page. What I want you to see is that red bit will uh, converge uh, in some sense to a line segment. Like it'll be a little piece of line. Uh, similarly, uh, this green part will squish and it will also converge to a line segment. Now a line segment is a one-dimensional object. That means that, uh, you know, if you can, in your mind's eye, imagine being a one-dimensional creature and in the middle of a line segment, you could walk around. Right? You could walk forward, you could walk back assuming you're far away from the boundary. Now, what kind of thing does, uh, when, when both of these shrink, when the green one shrinks and the red one shrinks, the blue one in turn will shrink. What kind of thing does the blue one shrink to? Does it shrink to a line segment? Nah, it's gonna shrink down to a single point. It's gonna become a single point. So in some sense, in some sense, uh, that point is a, a much smaller kind of thing than a line segment. So let's, uh, let's make that uh, as precise as possible. So uh, the original area. Uh, the original area was UV. Uh, the uh, new area Well, it's the sum of four, uh, four things. It's uh, UV plus delta UV plus U delta V plus delta U delta V. Uh, as a result, the change, the UVs, you know, computing uh, the new one minus the old one, uh, the UVs cancel, so the change is just uh, delta u v plus u delta v plus uh, delta u delta v. And remember all these, uh, all these delta u's and blah blah, they all depend on, uh, ha uh, on, on this sentence right here. Suppose we introduce a small change in x, delta x. So now let's go through the thought experiment, the standard calculus thought experiment of we made a small change in the input, delta x. Now let's let, uh, let's let uh, the change in the input become as small as possible. Uh, what's the name for the calculus concept of letting a thing become as small as possible? Fishing for an L word. Limit, Limit right? So now uh, let's, let, uh, let's let delta x go to zero in a limit. So if we compute the limit as delta x goes to zero of uh, the change in the area. Delta u v plus u delta v plus delta u delta v. And we'll divide this by delta x. Then, uh, well, before we do any limit, I'll uh, observe that uh, these three terms are all divided by delta x, so I'll divide the delta x uh, to each one. 
So this is the limit as uh, delta x goes to zero of delta u divided by delta x, then I'll multiply by v, plus u multiplied by delta v divided by delta x, plus, now I'll take the delta x to either one, it doesn't matter, delta u over delta x multiplied by delta v, like so. And here's the thing. Now we get to make the, we get to make the, the oldest calculus joke there is. <laughs> it's been going on for two and a half centuries. So uh, delta, that's a letter uh, in an alphabet, but not our alphabet. What alphabet? The Greek alphabet, right? And uh, you know, there's a, in a sense, uh, it, 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 it's far too simplifying uh, to say that uh, there's sort of like two major European cultures for most of history. That's far, far too simplifying, but to some sense we can say it. Uh, the, the Greek culture and the Latin culture, and that's uh, offensive to as many people as possible. <laughs> I, don't, I don't hold to that, but we're gonna go with that for a moment. Uh, so we've got delta, it's a Greek letter. It's phonetically, uh, oh, also, the English alphabet, by the way, is derived from the Latin alphabet. That's just a historical fact. So uh, the, uh, what, what English letter corresponds to Greek delta? D. So the, the, old, <laughs> the oldest uh, calculus trick, kind of like a pun really, almost uh, joke, is that uh, when you have uh, the limit of a bunch of expressions that, have, uh, that, are, that, <laughs> that are in the Greek alphabet, then when you compute, when you compute the limit, then uh, all those things change to their corresponding Latin equivalents. <laughs> Which is just to say that uh, to compute this limit, you just change all the deltas to d's. <laughs> That's all you do. I think it's hilarious. du, dx, v, plus u, dv, dx, plus du, dx. And now here's the last one that requires just a little bit of thought. And that is, uh, you know, what, uh, what do we do with the delta v? Well, uh, remember that uh, delta v, that was a measurement of how much, uh, how much that little bit uh, changed as, uh, a, a, in response to a change of delta x. So if delta x is going to zero, then what's delta v doing? It's also going to zero. Uh, as a result, uh, this is zero. Delta V goes to zero. But wait a second. So that means uh, that term is zero. And uh, wait a second, what is this? What is that? It is the product rule. That's it. The reason why the product rule has those uh, the sum of two things, and each of which is two factors, is because uh, it, the product rule is saying that uh, uh, you're measuring how a rectangle is changing. And uh, it is that, that part and that part which contribute. Just these two parts, base times height, base times height. That part, in the end, in the limit, is too small to contribute. So the product rule is really about uh, how a rectangle is changing. Very interesting. Any question about it? Yeah? So the delta, so the delta V is the zero? Well, what I did is I took this delta X and I arbitrarily associated it with the delta U uh, so that it looked like that, delta U over delta X times delta V. I could have just as well put it under that one. It been, the result would be the same. Uh, it's, the reason is because uh, that thing, delta U, over delta x goes to du dx, the derivative of u with respect to x. But uh, that one, by itself, goes to zero. So that whole term goes to zero. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, good. <clears throat> so.
So, uh, now we want to talk about, uh, for a moment, uh, the uh, interpretations of first and second derivative. Now, this is where I just have to rely on uh, the fact that uh, you must have taken a Calculus one course. And you must be aware that, uh, uh, you know, you could compute the second derivative of something ad infinitum. Uh, fine. So for the first derivative, For the first derivative, uh, well, there's a geometric interpretation. The geometric interpretation of, uh, of derivative is uh, the slope uh, of tangent line. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if mathematicians had their way, you know, in a, in, in a sense, you know, everything would be construed that way. <laughs> but uh, it's not. Uh, mathematicians don't uniformly get their way. Um, you know, uh, another just as, in, in, in a sense, just as good way to reckon math things is in, in physical circumstances. So in physics, like in a physical uh, situation, uh, the interpretation of the first derivative, uh, specifically, uh, in some sense, the sign of the first derivative, is telling you whether or not the quantity you're measuring, say, measuring versus time, is increasing or decreasing. So, uh, you know, decreasing uh, or increasing. Uh, to give you an example. Suppose that uh, we have a <coughs> function whose plot looks more or less like this. Then uh, I claim from a purely geometric uh, considerations, you should be able to tell me, uh, so at, uh, at that point, uh, is the derivative going to be Negative, positive, or zero? Positive. Uh, the reason why is that, well, uh, you know, put a point there. And now, uh, you know, just eyeballing it, sketch the tangent line. The tangent line looks more or less like this. So what we're saying is that, uh, you know, the red world is smooth. And, uh, you know, if I could draw, if I was an excellent artist, which I'm not, uh, at that point, uh, you could, in some sense, just replace the red world with the green world. And you wouldn't be able to, de to detect any difference uh, as long as you stayed near that place, right? Just like uh, you could replace, in a sense, for, you know, if you had like a, like a, like a cow out in the middle of a, uh, Kansas, and you were magical, you could like, you know, snap your fingers and stop the world and uh, replace the whole world with, you know, like a 10, a 10 mile radius actual flat world. <laughs> the cow would never know. Same thing here. So uh, this uh, here, what we're saying is that the, the derivative is positive here. Uh, similarly, uh, how about uh, right here? Is the derivative uh, negative, zero, or positive? Negative, for reasons that are, you know, basically exactly the same. You consider that point, you attach the tangent line, you have a look at that line and say, oh, yeah, that line's sloping down. So that's uh, negative.
so uh, now, because this, uh, because this function is so, so nice, uh, if over here the derivative is positive and over there the derivative is negative, uh, and you can kind of go through the uh, imagination of taking that point you know, and wiggling it around and watching the tangent line wiggle around, if right here the tangent line has positive slope and over there the tangent line has negative slope, then uh, it stands to reason that somewhere that uh, the tangent line should have, should have slope zero. So where is that on this example? Yeah, the very top there. So there the derivative is zero. Okay, similar things, you know, you can go through the thought experiment of moving that tangent line all over the place. Uh, now, a very common task in, uh, for this uh, kind of thing is the construction of something called a slope chart, which is to say, uh, I want you to determine for me uh, at every point whether or not uh, the function is uh, increasing, decreasing, or stationary, meaning that uh, the tangent line is horizontal there. So uh, for this specific example, it would look like this. You say, okay, well, here's the domain of the function. It doesn't go further to the left, so I need to mark that. Uh, and here, it doesn't go further to the right, so I need to mark that. And then when you are uh, making a slope chart, you uh, have to find all the critical points. Now, what's a critical point? That's the, in a sense, that's where the, the derivative might change signs. So one of the possibilities is where the derivative is zero. What's the other possibility? The derivative is undefined. So like, uh, like at a pointy place, like, uh, like absolute value. Okay, because uh, you know, in your mind's eye, imagine absolute value uh, at the minimum, at the pointy place, uh, to the left of the origin, the derivative of absolute value exists and is negative. To the right of the origin, the derivative of absolute value exists and is positive. But uh, at the origin, in your mind's eye, imagine living, living on the absolute value world. And there you are, standing on the pointy place, looking back and forth. It doesn't matter how small you are. It will never look flat, no matter how small you get. So there's no derivative. There's no tangent line there, and therefore no derivative. So uh, to, make a, to make a slope chart, you find, all the, you find the domain, find all the critical points. Here's one. So there's a, you know, usually you know, make a fence post there. And then uh, here's another one where the derivative is zero. So then now in each region, uh, you sort of just label it with a label that says everywhere in here, uh, the derivative is positive, everywhere, whatever. So the symbol. Uh, in this region, since everywhere, notice all of that red, the tangent lines have positive slope. So you label it like this. Uh, notice that uh, in the middle region, what's the sign of the der derivative in the middle region? Negative. So you label it with something that looks like this. And then in the right region, like this. So such a thing, these arrows, are referred to as a slope chart. Any question about it? OK. So now, uh, where physics is concerned. So this is sort of like a geometry thing. Uh, for, for a physics uh, considerations, uh, suppose, uh, suppose that uh, you're going to skydive from a helicopter. It doesn't really matter what you skydive from. I just say helicopter so that we can go with the fiction that uh, you don't have to have any horizontal velocity. I'm not concerned about that. I'm only concerned about uh, altitude. Suppose you skydive uh, and your altitude, altitude is, uh, you know, We'll, we, we'll denote it with variable y. 
And uh, because this is a physical problem, you know, we're uh, considering it to be dynamical, that is to say, changing in time. Uh, the altitude is y. Uh, what is your expectation? about uh, the sine. of dy dt. I claim from just physical considerations alone, you should be able to tell me right now <laughs> what should be true about dy dt. It's got to be negative. What would it mean uh, if dy dt, you know, you're skydiving. What, <laughs> what would it mean if dy dt is zero? Yeah, that means that your altitude is not changing. That would mean like uh, you jumped out of, the, out of the helicopter and you just floated there. <laughs> right? That's not how it works. Uh, what would it mean if dy dt uh, were positive? That would mean that uh, you're going to meet the rotors, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not going to be good. <laughs> it's not going to be good. Right? dy dt is positive, that means that your altitude is increasing. No, in a physical... Uh, exercise, uh, your expectation is that uh, dy dt should be negative. Uh, because, uh, well, you're falling. So, on such, uh, on such uh, physical exercises, uh, it's kind of in an abstract exercise, it's kind of easy to be off by a sign. Where, you know, like something like the answer is supposed to be 8, but uh, you responded with negative 8. In an abstract exercise, that's a, a, in some cases a little bit understandable. But uh, if I give you such a question that's about skydiving, and uh, you report to me that dy dt is positive, then, okay, in the first place, that's, you've made a math error somewhere. But uh, I would argue that uh, you've made a, a categorical error. Like uh, you've severely misunderstood that uh, because y represents your altitude and dy dt represents the change in your altitude, a positive dy dt would mean you're going up. So if you report to me a positive dy dt, that's not a little bit wrong, that's a lot wrong. Because that's a conceptual problem. Good. Any question about this? Okay, so that's the first derivative. Now here's the thing, uh, a line, every uh, line, well, every non-vertical line, is representable with a degree one polynomial, right? They can all be written as mx plus b. They're all degree one polynomials. Uh, what about uh, degree two polynomials? What are they all representable as? Plotting. So degree two polynomials are so special that uh, they have, you know, degree one polynomials are so special that they have a name, lines. Uh, degree two polynomials are so special that they have a name, quadratics. Uh, what's the name of the shape of the plot of a quadratic? Parabola, Parabola right? So just like uh, lines, you can kind of break lines into two groups, those that slope down and those that slope up. You know, and I guess ones that are horizontal, you know. But uh, I'll ignore the horizontal case for the moment. Lines that uh, slope down and lines that slope up. Parabolas also have the same, uh, the same thing. Those that open down and those that open up. So <clears throat> the second derivative. So uh, geometrically, the first derivative is slope. What's the second derivative? Now it's a C word. <laughs> okay, uh, from physics, in, from, in the physical interpretation, I agree, it's acceleration. Or, you know, yeah, acceleration's good. But uh, what about in the geometry? Start, it's a C word, starts with C. 
ends with on cavity. <laughs> Conca concavity, yeah. So uh, that one. So just like when you look at a line, it has this intrin intrinsic measure that we ref that we call slope, uh, and they can have positive slope of varying degrees and negative slope of varying degrees. Uh, parabolas also have this uh, invariant measure called concavity. You know, they they can they can open up and be really sharp, or open up and be flat, ish. Uh, but all of those are positive concavity, and then you know you can have it going down. Uh, fine. <clears throat> so just like uh, this is a, when you're considering this in the first derivative, this is a slope chart. If you were analyzing this from the point of view of the second derivative, you could make something called a concavity chart. So <clears throat> so now, uh, more or less the same plot. That was my intention. Uh, let's consider it from the point of view of uh, concavity. Now, from the point of view of slope, the idea was is let's look at a little bitty bite of it right there between my fingers and then ask, uh, okay, that little bitty red bit that's between my fingers, if you had to consider that to be a line, would you consider that to be a positively sloping line or a negatively sloping line? Yeah, probably positive, you know, right there, that stuff that's between my fingers. Okay, the derivative is positive there. Now, uh, the idea is, okay, let's consider like uh, that much of it. And the question is, is uh, now don't, don't, don't consider it uh, between lines, you know, not, not that. We're not asking what's, what's the best line match. We're asking what's the best parabola match. So for this part right here, uh, what would you say if you had to guess? Is this like a parabola that opens down or one that opens up? Yeah. Down, I think. And uh, similarly over here, uh, that part kind of looks to me like a parabola that opens up. Just that part. Uh, now, if you look at the whole thing, globally it doesn't look like either one. But locally, you know, just that part kind of looks like a parabola that opens down, and uh, just that part kind of looks like a parabola that opens up. And uh, globally, this doesn't look like a line, but uh, locally, it does. Uh, fine. <clears throat> so what we're saying is that over here, it's kind of like a parabola that opens down, and over here, it's kind of like a parabola that opens up. Uh, so somewhere in between those two places, uh, there must be a transition to where it's sort of like neither or both. You know, because if it's downish, over here and upish, over here, where does, it, where does the transition occur? Okay, so some of you, some of y'all are familiar with the idea and can just point it out, uh, but uh, I'll give you one more way to look at it, uh, to so you can identify it readily. So consider the thought experiment that uh, we're driving on this road and we're going this way. So we're going this way. Now, to, to stay on the road, would the steering wheel need to be, you know, on this part, would the steering wheel need to be to the left, to the right, or straight ahead? To the right, to, the right, to stay on the road. It, you'd have to be going to, uh, holding the steering wheel to the right. Similarly, uh, over here, uh, to stay on the road going that way, the steering wheel would have to be to the left. So, if here uh, the steering wheel would need to be to the right, and here the steering wheel would need to be the left, that means that uh, there must be some place right in the middle of that S-curve where the steering wheel needed to be straight up. It's about right here. That point uh, is significant enough uh, to have a name. What's the name for that kind of point? The point of inflection. So it's uh, quite likely that uh, you went through an enormous number of points of inflection today, honestly. Right? Because, uh, you know, if you uh, 
if you're driving on the road, if you did a lane change, you went through a point of inflection. <laughs> Unless you were on a road that, uh, where the road was doing it, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, walking around, avoiding people and obstacles. Uh, good. So, uh, in order to make a slope chart, I mean a concavity chart, well, you do the same thing, similar thing. You uh, find uh, the domain of the function and the domain of the derivative, and you find everywhere that uh, the second derivative is zero or undefined, critical points of the second derivative. This function is smooth enough to where it's defined everywhere, but it does have that one place where the second derivative is zero. That means that uh, to the left of this point it has a uh, one kind of concavity, and to the right of that point, it has a different kind. So in this place, uh, it has a, which one, negative or positive concavity? Negative, negative concavity. And uh, that's symbolized just like uh, that's the, this one is the symbol for positive slope. That one is the symbol for negative concavity. Uh, and this one is the symbol for positive concavity. And then, you know, just as a cute kind of way to deal with it or think about it, uh, you could draw little googly eyes on the top of the plot. It always has to be above. So you just uh, look at that right there. And then you ask, is that guy uh, smiling or frowning? <laughs> He's frowning, right? And uh, frowny people are negative. They have a negative out outlook on life, right? So this one is concave down, like a frown. Uh, and this one is concave up. Look at that big old smile there. Good. Any question about this? So, uh, you know, the, the geometry and physics goes on, uh, but we're going to leave it at the second derivative. But uh, if you were to stay, if you were to continue, uh, I don't know of a geometry name for the like slope and concavity for third derivative, but uh, it's important in physics. And uh, the physics name for third derivative is jerk. <laughs> I'm not even joking. That's what it is. I find that, uh, you know, there's lots of good joke material in there uh, for that one. So uh, let's uh, have an exercise. So I'm going to make a little hidden block. You know, normally, so, so far, I've made little blocks that I called remarks and little blocks that I called exercises. So here I'm making a hidden block. Uh, which uh, is to say that I'm going to write some stuff and uh, you can take it to be the, you know, the kind of thing I might do back in my office when I'm making you an exercise. Uh, so I'm showing you right here and now what I'm doing. So I'll, uh, I'll choose two numbers. And I'll make them smallish because this, you know, I'm doing it right in front of us. Uh, otherwise, it you know, I don't want to make it too complicated for myself. Um, I'll take two numbers, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll make a polynomial using them. I'll make uh, the following polynomial. x minus 1 squared multiplied by x minus 3. Uh, and then I'll multiply that all by 6, just uh, because. So now I'm going to multiply this out and collect like terms. So first I'll FOIL that. x squared uh, minus 2x plus 1 multiplied by x minus 3 multiplied by 6. OK, now I'll distribute the x minus 3 into the quadratic x cubed minus 2x squared plus x uh, minus 3x squared plus 6x minus 3. And then that all multiplied by 6. <coughs> so now I'll simplify that. I see an x cubed. Now I need to collect, so minus 5x squared. By the way, if I was really making this back in my office, I'd never do it by hand, right? <laughs> I just tell a machine to do it. That way I don't make a mistake. Uh, then plus 7x uh, 
uh, minus 3. Uh, finally, I'll distribute the 6. <coughs> so 6x cubed minus 30x squared plus 42x minus 18. And again, this is, uh, this is some stuff that you wouldn't see. This would be something that uh, I did back in my office, hidden from your view. So here's the exercise. Let, uh, let f of x be the following function. 3 halves times x to 4 uh, minus 10 times x to 3 plus 21 times x squared minus 18 times x plus 1, 3, 2, 6. So there's some nice function there. <clears throat> uh, the request is for you to, uh, uh, so part A is, uh, uh, what do I want to say? I want you to make a slope chart. <clears throat> and then uh, in part B, I want you to uh, find uh, all so your calculus one instructor did they did, uh, did they call them uh, re uh, relative maxes or local maxes both I mean in my heart they'll always be local maxes <laughs> but uh, I just want to use the same word that uh, that your instructor used it's all over the local Okay, so find all local extrema. Okay. So for part A, uh, well, we want to make a slope chart. So um, the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out uh, the domain. Of f. Well, what's f's domain? All reals. Why is uh, why is uh, f's domain all reals? Right. Uh, the only thing that could cause the domain to be less than all the reals is if uh, there was like a division by zero or something. Right. So, like the function one over x. You can plug in positive x's, you can plug in negative x's, but you can't plug in 0 because you can't divide by 0. So 1 over x is a function whose domain is all reals except 0. Uh, or if there was a, an even radical, like a square root, then uh, you can't plug in negative things into the square root. But uh, because this is the first exercise and because we have other things to do, uh, I gave us a polynomial. And that's the, like, the nicest, tamest kind of function that there is. OK, so the domain is, uh, is the whole shebang uh, because f is a polynomial. OK, uh, fine. So remember, on the previous page, we said to talk about a slope chart, you say, well, you figure out the domain, and then you look for what kind of points? Critical points. And then uh, there's two varieties of critical point. What are they? So, right, when the derivative is zero, that corresponds to a horizontal tangent. Or when the derivative does not exist, that corresponds to a place where there's no tangent whatsoever. So we want to find the critical points. All right, so we need to compute the derivative of f. Now, in case you didn't uh, catch 
what I was doing. Up here at the top, you know, we made, uh, I made that hidden block. I said, uh, you know, this is something that you wouldn't see me doing. And then I sort of carefully, uh, you know, performed that boring calculation there. And then I said, consider this function, which uh, at least at first glance doesn't seem to have anything to do with that hidden block. But what? What's the derivative of this? That, <laughs> right? Here's a function whose derivative is that. Let's do it, term by term. Uh, what's the derivative of uh, 3 halves x to 4? Well, the 4 would come down, right? And then it would be x cubed. So it would be something x cubed. Now you could multiply that uh, 4 by the 3, that'd be 12. And then divide by 2 and get 6. Okay, then minus, what's the derivative of that term? 30x squared, okay. What's the derivative of that term? 42x. And that one? Minus 18x. Uh, no, just 18, right? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I threw in the 1326 just because I knew it was not even relevant. <laughs> just, you know, just so I could get it in there one more time. Okay. So now, uh, is there anywhere that uh, this is undefined? No. Uh, because, uh, well, because f was a polynomial, that means its derivative is a polynomial, and polynomials are as good as it gets. Uh, so there's none, which is to say it's defined everywhere. That's just another way to see that uh, a polynomial is the kind of function that uh, is smooth everywhere. Uh, but besides the derivative being zero, we also want to know when the derivative is zero. Uh, which means that uh, we want to solve this thing equal to zero. Okay, in order to do that, let's uh, see if we can simplify this a little bit. So in the first place, uh, okay, we gotta f we're going to need to factor it. So I can see that the coefficients are all divisible by 2. And uh, the coefficients are all also divisible by 3. Ah, so they're divisible by 6. And if I factor out the 6, then it looks like x cubed minus 5x squared plus 7x minus 3. I wasn't even looking at that. I was just copying that. <laughs> So it, it looks like that. Now I have a cubic. So, uh, so uh, how do you factor a cubic? Sorry? I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I follow. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, so uh, has anyone heard of uh, synthetic division? Yeah. Now I came to this point. Uh, you know, I teach this class uh, two 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 sections of this class, and uh, it was uh, you know like uh, panic. <laughs> the fear was like uh, you know. You could cut it with a knife. So uh, I'll, not try <laughs> I'll not try and do uh, uh, synthetic division here and now, but I'll set a homework assignment to remind you of this thing that the state of Texas assures me that you know. 
Uh, so then you can, you can perform this factorization using the rational zeros theorem. and synthetic division. The rational zeros theorem says that uh, if this thing has any rational zeros, then the zeros must be either negative 1, positive 1, negative 3, or positive 3. Uh, so there's just four choices. And then synthetic division is a quick way to confirm or deny each one of those four. Uh, so once you find one, then the, it's downhill very quick from there. And, uh, you know, one is one of them. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's omit that part and say, all right, suppose that uh, we, we, one way or another, factor it to here. So then, then the question, the question that we were trying to address is, uh, is there anywhere that the derivative is zero? Where? Right. So that is to say that uh, notice that, uh, well, for example, if you, give, if you provide input, say, 10, then this would be 6, that would be 9, and then you'd square it, and that'd be 81, and that'd be 7. So you'd have, you know, something positive times something positive times something positive. That wouldn't be zero. But uh, notice, notice if you plug in three, then uh, that factor would be zero. And it doesn't matter what any of the other ones are, because the, the product's going to be zero. So that means that, uh, this is, uh, that the derivative is zero at one, and also at x is three. So now uh, we're going to make the slope chart. The slope chart is uh, we'll plot the domain from step one and the critical points from step two. So the domain is the whole thing. But conceivably, it could have been you know, less than that. Uh, so now we're going to uh, plot the critical points, uh, 1 and 3. So here we have 1 and 3. So the work up to now has basically been the following, that uh, we want to figure out the domain, and we want to carve it up into pieces uh, with the cuts occurring at the critical points. Now, uh, there's three pieces, the one on the left, the one in the middle, and the one on the right. Uh, what do we want to do with each one of those pieces? Pick a number. So how about uh, zero is in there. Zero is to the left of one. Something between one and three, about two, yeah. And something to the right of three? Four. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to do something with zero, two, and four. What are we going to do? Plug it into that? No, the derivative. That one? Why not that one? OK, why the derivative? OK, good. Now, to be clear, uh, now wait a second. I remember taking calculus the first time. Uh, and I seem to recall that uh, some of the time when I was doing something kind of like that, I was plugging stuff into the second derivative. And uh, my memory's hazy. I'm not sure what the, you know, are, you, are we sure that this isn't, we don't want to use the second derivative? Why do we want to use the first derivative? Yeah, because we're making a slope chart, right? Under what circumstance would we be plugging into the second derivative if we were making a concavity chart? And uh, if we wanted to make a jerk chart, then we could use the third derivative. 
So is it clear that uh, because we're making a slope chart and because the first derivative is telling you about slope, we're plugging into the first derivative? Okay, good. So uh, in particular, we're, uh, we're, so let me write that down. So because it's a slope chart, Uh, therefore, we'll evaluate these points in the first derivative. Now, really, for the purpose of the chart, uh, we're only interested in the sign, the SIGN. We're not interested in the specific value. So, here goes. So concerning this, this factored representation, uh, we want to know what, what it would be like to plug in uh, 0. Well, that 6 would be a 6, so I'll just write down 6 for that. And then uh, 0 minus 1, that's something negative. So that would be negative, and that's going to be squared. And then 0 minus 3, that's something negative. So the pattern in that region would look like that. 6 times something negative that's going to be squared times uh, something negative. So in the middle region, if we plug in 2, 6, and then 2 minus 1, that's something positive, and we're going to square it, and then 2 minus 3, that's something negative. So that's the pattern in the middle region, uh, and then uh, in the rightmost region we want to plug in 4, so that'd be 6 multiplied by 4 minus 1 is something positive, and we're going to square it. Uh, 4 minus 3 is something positive, like that. So again, that's just the pattern. Now the question is, is that uh, concerning each pattern, what's the overall sign? So what's the overall sign of that? Negative, right? Because 6 is positive. Uh, that negative in the middle is going to be squared, so it's positive. So we're still positive. And then one more negative, so we're negative. So the stylized uh, symbol for that is a downward sloping line. Okay, how about in the middle region? Negative again. The right region? Positive. So that's the slope chart. You find the domain, you carve it up into pieces with the critical points, you label each piece uh, with a negative or positive slope as appropriate. Any question about making a slope chart? So now, uh, at this point, uh, a lot of students uh, you know, kind of, my experience tells me that uh, you may be looking at this chart thinking like, I don't know, something I don't, I don't feel comfortable. Uh, and usually the reason is that uh, their Calculus One instructor made it to where the slope charts always were alternating, where it was always negative slope and then positive slope and then negative slope and then positive slope. Uh, well, they might have done that, but uh, only because uh, they're wimps. <laughs> So uh, there's nothing wrong with having a, uh, a slope repeated. In fact, you can give me, you can give me any uh, sequence of the word uh, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, 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 up, 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 whatever you like, and I can give you a function that does that. Okay, it can be down, down, up, I promise. Uh, good. So then now the question is uh, for part B. Uh, so that was all part A. Uh, for part B, is there, <clears throat> uh, are there any local extrema? So, is there a local, are there any local mins? There is? Okay, where? At three. And uh, I claim, my claim is that uh, the slope chart sort of makes it obvious. 
but can you say it out loud? What, uh, why the slope, in what way the slope chart is saying that three is a min? <laughs> right, you know, even if you just, you know, if I take my glasses off and squint a little bit, it even looks like a, even looks like a min, right? And that's part of the purpose of making the chart that way. Uh, fine. Are there any other mins? Minima? Nope, that's the only one. Uh, how about, uh, are there any local maxes? There are none. Uh, because you would need it to change, you would need it to go, uh, you need it to go up and then down. So I've got to look at two consecutive regions. Is, are these two consecutive regions up and then down? How about uh, these, up and then down? Okay. So as a result, there's no max. Yeah, you're, looking for, you're looking for this, something that looks like this. You know, there aren't any in the chart. There's one of these. That's a min. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, so that's the answer to the, to the question. Uh, but uh, my teacher sense is telling me that uh, I should make further comment about the down-down thingy. Uh, if we plot y is x cubed, well, that's a, a plot that uh, you're expected to memorize its shape. That's just one of them, like a parabola. That's just something you're supposed to know. So the, that's, its name is the cubic. Uh, the right side kind of looks like a parabola, really, a little bit. And, uh, you know, if I were to just reflect that over there, it would be a parabola. But uh, it's kind of like uh, someone took a parabola, took this left arm that's uh, up, and then twists it uh, down so that it looks like this. More or less. So uh, what I want you to witness about this is that uh, how about uh, at this point right here uh, that I'm indicating? Does the tangent line, is the tangent line have positive slope or negative slope there? Positive slope, right? So right there uh, it has positive slope. How about uh, right here? Positive slope. But uh, here's the thing. Uh, what happens is that this, if you can imagine moving around this little tangent there, you know, moving it around, when you move it through the origin, it's flat. Uh, that is to say, it's always flat. But uh, at the origin, it's horizontal. So at the origin, it's horizontal. So that means that uh, this function has a critical point at the origin, uh, and it is uh, slope up, and then up. So it can happen. <clears throat> if you were to draw the slope chart of this, it would look like this. Up, up. Now, our specific function, uh, the way it works is, uh, you know, from, uh, from the left, it's coming down from infinity, and it goes down, becomes flat momentarily, goes down some more, becomes flat momentarily, and then goes up. So uh, our specific function looks like this. Down, flat, down, hor uh, horizontal, I mean, and then uh, up. So that's what our function looks like. Down, down, up. Any question about it? <clears throat> okay, so now let's move on to uh, new things. So I think this is enough review just to, you know, so you can get used to the way I talk about the things, you know, because it's probably just slightly different than the way your previous instructor talked about. Uh, you know, and review some things that are relevant. Uh, now we can move to new things. So here we are in chapter 7. So this is section 7.1, uh, which is called anti-derivatives.
So uh, you know the the game the the game show, Jeopardy, with Alex Trebek. I hope you've had the occasion to see it a little bit. It's kind of kind uh, kind of funny because uh, it's a question and answer show, uh, but instead of uh, instead of giving you the question and you responding with the answer, it's actually reversed. You know uh, when you say, you know I'll have five hundred for. Yeah, no, I'll have, uh, you know, words that start with Q for 500, Alex, or whatever. Then uh, he responds with the answer, and you're supposed to say, you know, what is quadratic? You know, you have to, you have to, you have to phrase your response in the form of a question. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't, it doesn't count. Uh, all right. So, uh, here's the thing. Is that... Uh, Earlier today, an hour ago, I just I want to impress upon you that uh, we were looking at we were we were performing exercises where, in a sense, there were two slots. There was uh, the red slot and the green slot, and you know the 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 the, the exercise sort of conceptually has this, and then my task as an instructor is to fill in one of those boxes and then say, okay, now you've got to do the other one. Uh, so, you know, I could do uh, and did do uh, something like uh, this. Um, how about 3 multiplied by x to 10? You know, and then I say, okay, I want you to respond. And then you, then you dutifully say, oh, well, it's 30x to 9. So does everybody get the idea? Is that uh, uh, there's two slots, and uh, y uh, your job is to do this one. And you say, okay, uh, 30 multiplied by x to 9. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to take the exact same uh, concept, uh, str uh, you know, structural concept, anyway. Uh, and uh, still going to have two slots, a red slot and a green slot. <clears throat> but uh, now we're going to play Jeopardy, which is to say that uh, instead of... Uh, Instead of me providing the red box for you, uh, I'm going to provide the green one. And now you need to respond when I ask. I want you to tell me something whose derivative is 2x. So how about it? X squared, right? So do you get the game? It's, it's, the, it's in a sense the exact same game that we've been playing, but uh, just uh, I'm filling in the green box instead. Uh, now, I have a different question. Uh, suppose I, suppose I uh, pose for you the same exercise again. But uh, I, uh, gi I give you the additional constraint that uh, you're not allowed to uh, you're not allowed to reproduce any answer that you already gave me. So is it is it impossible to to win or what? Like what? Okay, so like I could say like x squared plus one three two six, right? <laughs> that'd work. Uh, that'd work. Uh, be, well, in the end, because uh, the derivative is additive, and furthermore, the derivative of a constant is zero. So that uh, that one three two six it differentiates to zero, uh, and it has no uh, it has no effect on what gets put in, uh, corresponds to it in the green box. 
can, can we agree without further comment that, in fact, uh, I could have written any constant there? Uh, so, in fact, uh, I could say that uh, this is x squared. The derivative of x squared plus c is 2x for any constant c. Okay. So now, uh, well, what we want to do now is we want to formalize uh, this notion of um, of me giving you the green box instead of the red box. So uh, specifically, uh, I kind of I, I want to uh, you know bring something to your attention. And that is that, uh, consider this, 3 multiplied by y is equal to x. Now, if I asked you to solve for y, uh, then what would you need to do? <laughs> Divide by 3. So, uh, and uh, division by 3 is the same as multiplication by 1 third. So, uh, you know, what I'm saying is that uh, these two equations uh, have, are equivalent. They have the same meaning. What's, uh, what's happened is that notice that the y's stayed on the same side. The x's stayed on, stayed on its side. Uh, what happened is that the 3 moved. But, uh, you know, the 3 moves. Uh, the 3 is, it's multiplied by 3 on the left, but to get it to the other side, it's uh, multiplied by its multiplicative inverse, 1 third. So to get the 3 to the other side, it sort of changes its appearance from 3 to 1 third. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, we could, uh, so that's, you know, like 1. Uh, we could do y plus 3 is equal to x. And suppose I said, I want you to solve for y. OK. Well, y is here, x is here, and then now it'll be subtract 3. But really, uh, that's just a short way to, to say add negative 3. So the 3 changes its uh, side. And uh, in doing that, it changes from add 3 to subtract 3. I promise I have a point here. Uh, well, how about uh, how about uh, this one? Uh, if we want uh, y squared is equal to x, then we want to solve for y. So uh, we want y to stay on its side and x to stay on its side. So somehow I've got to get the two to change sides. Right. So when it changes sides, it becomes square root. One more before we get to the punchline. <clears throat> uh, how about, uh, you know, uh, the natural log of y equal to x. Suppose we want to solve for y. Now we want to, you know, here we wanted the multiply by 3 to change sides. Here we wanted the add 3 to change sides. Here we want the exponent uh, 2 to change sides. Here we want the logarithm to change sides. So when logarithm change, changes sides, what does it become? So we want y to stay on its side. We want x to stay on its side. Right, exponential. So when, uh, when logarithm changes, really, uh, I'm going to write one intermediate step here. So in this class, when we write exponential, we write e with superscript x. But, uh, you know, in uh, other classes, you can write, and in this class, as far as I'm concerned, exp of x, exponential of x. So when logarithm changes sides, it becomes exponential. 
Uh, in, our, in, in our class, we write that as e to x. Now, I hope it's obvious what I'm going to ask. Is that, uh, what about in this equation, if we wanted d dx to change sides? Right? Because if multiply by 3 can change sides, and, and this changes from 3 to multiply by 3 to multiply by a third, add 3, be, changes sides to add negative 3, exponent 2 becomes uh, exponent half, or square root. What does a, uh, what do you got to do to get ddx on the other side? Okay. That's the, that's the answer to the, to the, to the question. <coughs> Is that uh, if you have, <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll write it like this. Uh, let big F and little f be functions. The following are equivalent. So what uh, in a math class, when, uh, when the instructor writes the following are equivalent. That means that uh, I'm about to make a list of things, and uh, every item in the list is equivalent to every, one, every other one in the list. So it's, it's, it's going to be four identical ways to say the same thing. Four ways to say the same thing. So first, uh, the derivative, uh, I want to say the derivative. the derivative of big F is little f. So that's like uh, rendering a statement in English. But then uh, we could have another statement. <coughs> we could have another statement uh, that uh, doesn't require English. And we can say derivative like that of big F is little f. So those two uh, items in the list are, the, uh, are, are two ways to say the same thing. Now I want to move the ddx to the other side. So uh, the way it gets moved to the other side is that, uh, so 3, is that uh, big F will stay on its side little f will stay on its side. And we want, uh, we want the, the ddx to change sides. Now, for historical reasons, uh, when something like that changes sides, sometimes it looks kind of weird. What I mean to say is that, uh, you know, who would have thought <laughs> that when the two uh, changes sides, it, it's going to look like that? And, uh, you know, who would have thought that uh, when the logarithm changes sides, it's going to do that. You know, no one, <laughs> no one is the answer. You know, it's just, it's not just historical nonsense, and now we're stuck with it. It's just baggage. In the end, is the reason. Uh, so, what I'm about to write, honestly, is just a bunch of historical baggage. But uh, that's what that's what we're stuck with. So, to get the ddx to move to the other side. It moves, it splits into two pieces, and then it looks like this. And uh, it also actually has to leave something on the other side. It has to leave a plus C. And uh, under normal circumstances, uh, more, more typical circumstances, you would, you would write them in the other order. Yeah, you'd, sit, you'd write this on the left side and that on the right side. Uh, finally, <clears throat> four, here's a statement in English, an antiderivative of little f is Big F. So now, 
a little bit of grammar school. So uh, English is an SVO language which means that uh, the, way that, uh, the way that we uh, say things is we say the subject is the first, uh, is the first bit, and then the verb. The, the collection of subject and verb together is called predicate, and then uh, it's followed by the object, right? Like uh, I, the subject, eat, that's uh, the verb, so I eat is the predicate, and then the cookie is uh, the object, SVO. Uh, Spanish and Chinese are also SVO. Turkish is a SOV, which means they say subject, then object, then verb. So uh, the distinction between these two sentences is I, I change the positions of subject and object. Here, the subject is the derivative of big F. Whereas, uh, so in that sense, big F is the part of the subject. Uh, here, big F is part of the object. So I switch those. But uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that something, in, in consequence of me doing that, this had to change. The uh, and an. So what part of speech are those called? Articles. Right? And uh, uh, in English, there's a, there's a few different articles. You know, for example, like... This is, the, this is the way you do it uh, when, the, when the next word starts with a vowel sound. You know, A being the, if it was a consonant sound. Uh, but at any rate, the main distinction I want to point out is that uh, this one is called the definite article and this one the indefinite. Uh, the definite article indicates uniqueness. Right? So I could say like the government of the United States. Right? You'd be really confused if I said a government of the United States. Right? Because, like, uh, wait a second, what are we talking about here? <laughs> you know? uh, but uh, it wouldn't make any sense for me to say, you know, for us to be standing uh, next to a pile of cookies and say, uh, yeah, would you please get me the cookie? <laughs> what, what cookie? Right? It's a problem because it's, uh, there's too many of them. So the, what this is saying is that... Uh, is that uh, there is a derivative of big F, and there is only one derivative of big F, and it is little f, there is no other. Uh, whereas this is saying that uh, among the possibilities uh, for antiderivatives of little f, big F is one of them. That is uh, this here. An antiderivative of 2x is x squared. An antiderivative of 2x is x squared plus 1326. Uh, it's a result uh, that uh, we won't prove in this class, but uh, I promise it's true that, uh, in fact, every derivative of 2x can be expressed in the form x squared plus a constant. There aren't any others. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So uh, to use this in a, uh, you know, to see, to see what it's like to use it. Uh, how about uh, I, I ask this? So what I'm, what I'm telling you is that uh, this question is just like, is just like uh, this kind of question where I filled in the green box. I'm asking you a Jeopardy question. I'm saying, would you please tell me something whose derivative is 3x squared? What kind of thing has a derivative equal to 3x squared? x cubed does. So to have it right, we have to write x cubed plus c. Because uh, if you write, uh, if you just write x cubed, that, uh, that, uh, that, that's showing that uh, you don't understand that uh, that it's, that it's not just x cubed, it's, it's, it's x cubed plus any constant. It's, it's like uh, the same confusion uh, in, the, in the articles. Okay, good. How about, uh, how about, um, you know, uh, would you please tell, no, I don't want to do that one. That one. Oh, yeah, here, here we go. Uh, what's the antiderivative of the exponential function?
which is to say, can you tell me something whose derivative is the exponential function? <laughs> the exponential function, right? Right? Because what's the derivative of e to x? e to x. All right. How about uh, how about uh, the antiderivative of? Well, let's do this one. Why not? X squared. X squared. Okay, good. Very good. Okay. Uh, how about, uh, now here's one. Uh, how about uh, this one? So now this one requires, you know, in comparison to the previous ones, requires just a, uh, uh, a moment of thought. Because, uh, you know, this one was kind of easy because, uh, in a sense, because that three was there. If that three wasn't, it's the three being there that made it easy. I, I, to me, anyway, I claim. Uh, you know, this one, uh, if there were a 6 there, then the answer would be straightforward. It, the answer would be x to 6, right? Right. So to, to make it easy for us, you know, we can kind of put a 6 there. Uh, but you can't just put a 6 there, right? So to, to get it right, uh, if that 6 were there, it would be x to 6 and then plus c. But that's not right. So the correction to, to make it right is uh, this 1 sixth. So now in your, in your head, compute the derivative of that term. What is it? x to 5. And the derivative of the constant? 0. So the derivative of all of that is? x to 5. Okay. So, now, uh, that's kind of a clumsy way to, to think about it. So, uh, let me give you the game plan for the next, uh, for, for, for Tuesday. This is what we're going to do. Is that uh, we have, uh, you know, we talked about uh, the homogeneity rule for derivatives. And we talked about the additivity rule for derivatives. The homogeneity rule is that you can factor constant multipliers in and out. The additivity rule is that you can move across, add and subtract. Uh, we also talked about the product rule and the qu quotient rule and the chain rule. Now, those, those are all about the derivative. But because antiderivative is just uh, doing the same thing but in the reverse direction, that means that uh, corresponding to every one of those derivative rules is an antiderivative anti-rule. So, uh, you know, if there's a, if there's a homogeneity rule uh, for derivatives, then there should be something like it for antiderivatives. Uh, if there's a product rule for derivatives, there should be something corresponding to it for antiderivatives, et cetera. Uh, so, so I'm not going to bother us with, uh, with doing that right now, because I think we're at our conceptual, you know, we're maximum here, having, <laughs> having gone for over two hours. Uh, so let's just do a couple more easy ones and then uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call it a, a week. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll post them tonight. The, you know, e-learning e was broken all day yesterday. These folks killing me. Actually, as I understand it, uh, like, uh, you know, e e uh, well, the Nat School of Natural Sciences and Math had a problem, ha it has an ongoing problem. And, uh, you know, e-learning had the, their thing all day yesterday. And, like, uh, it's apparently, like, all kinds of folks all over the globe are having problems right now. So yeah. Uh, at any rate, uh, so here's one. Uh, how about, uh, how about, uh, What about, uh, what's the antiderivative of x multiplied by x squared dx? Hmm. 
I don't, I'm not sure what you mean combined. Okay, so this is an antiderivative. Now, I haven't used the word integral. <laughs> the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, uh, many students uh, at approximately this level don't, don't understand that there's a distinction between them. And I promise you that uh, this thing that we're doing here is not an integral. It's an antiderivative. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so, uh, so that's exactly the wrong answer, but uh, it's, it is what I was uh, baiting for. Uh, because there's, there's no points at stake here. So uh, if I, you know, not to put words into your mouth, but I suspect that you did something like this. Uh, you said, okay, I want to find, uh, I want to find the antiderivative of that one and then multiply it by the antiderivative of that one. So uh, antiderivative of x. Can I think of something whose derivative is x? Well, the derivative of x squared is 2x. So the derivative of half x squared is x. So you, know, you might think of it like this, x squared over 2. The derivative of that one is that one. Uh, and then uh, what? what what would point to that one? X cubed over 3. So you, that's not exactly the answer that you said. But, but, uh, but, yeah, but it's related to the answer that you said. Now, here's the thing. We went over the product rule very carefully for derivatives, right? We talked about rectangles and how it's the sum of two things, and each one of those things is the product of two factors. So in particular, the derivative of uv is not the derivative of u multiplied by the derivative of v, right? Why, so what I'm saying is that uh, if the derivative doesn't work that way, how could we possibly have any hope that the antiderivative would? Right? So this is a, uh, this doesn't work. This is not right. Uh, ra rather, uh, rather we need to, uh, we need to proceed like you said, which is to say that, uh, well, I have a question. Uh, did, you take, uh, did you take algebra first or calculus first? Oh, you did? So then uh, it, would be good, uh, it would be good to perform any algebraic simplifications before you perform any calculus steps. Could you algebraically simplify that a little bit? Yeah? Uh, how does that algebraically simplify? to x cubed. And then now, can you tell me something whose derivative is x cubed? There you go. Right, because, uh, you know, if, it, if, if you just differentiate x to 4, then you get that 4 in front, but there's not a 4 to be had. So I'll, uh, I'll put this 1 fourth here and then uh, write plus c. So uh, the purpose of this kind of exercise is to, is to give that kind of heuristic punchline thing and say, oh, you took college algebra before you took calculus? Oh, really? <laughs> Maybe you should perform algebraic simplifications before calculus. It's uh, almost always a very good idea to do that. Uh, finally, we can end on a joke. So, you know, in, in math culture, and just science culture, science and math culture generally, uh, you know, mathematicians, the stereotype for a mathematician is uh, someone who's able to give you, an, you know, a very exact answer, uh, but uh, it's rarely useful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a <laughs> the stereotype of a physicist is the kind of person who, uh, you know, just thinks, one, among one of the stereotypes is that they just think they're, uh, extremely special and smart, like uh, everyone wishes they were like a physicist. I don't actually hold these opinions. These, this is just stereotypes. So, uh, so two, two physicists walk into a bar, and uh, you know, one of them says to the other one, aren't you, aren't you glad that we're physicists and we're so much smarter than everyone else? 
you know, and, and, and the other one says, yeah, yeah, it's great. And uh, <laughs> they say, and the, the second one says, but I think people may be smarter than you think. And so, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bartender comes up and says, what do you all have? And, uh, you know, they make their, their drink orders. And uh, the first one goes to the bathroom, and the second one gets the bartender and says, bartender, listen, when my friend comes back, I'm going to ask you a question. You're not going to have any idea what I'm talking about. That's fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, but when I ask you the question, you'll know. I want you to respond with x cubed over 3. Uh, can you repeat that for me, x cubed over 3? And the bartender says, x cubed over 3. I got it. I got it. And uh, so later, the, when, the, when the first one comes back, uh, the second one says to the bartender, bartender, I've got a question for you. I've got a question. Can you tell me, what's the antiderivative of x squared? And the bartender says, x cubed over 3. And he turns to his friend and says, ha, I told you. I told you that people know more than, than you think. And the bartender looks at, the, looks at him and says, plus C, you jerk. <laughs> right? Uh, so every time that I write the plus C, in my, in my head, my inner, my inner voice says, you jerk, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so I hope you'll have a nice weekend. <laughs>